In this example, we're going to walk you through the process of importing in a 3D model to machine in a two-sided environment. We'll discuss how to set up the part, how to add tabs to the part, and how to create dowel holds so you can index it properly on your CNC machine. If you've not worked with a two-sided project before, I recommend that you watch the Introduction to Two-Sided Machining tutorial before continuing with this project. For this tutorial, we're going to go ahead and open up a new instance of our software, and we're going to create a new file. That's going to be a double-sided job. And the width of the job is going to be 6 inches, and the height of the job is going to be 10. And our thickness of our material we're going to be using is going to be about 1 inch. When it comes to our zero position, we are going to be zeroing off our material surface. But when we flip over our material, I want to zero off my machine bed. That way I'm always referencing the top of my material. So I'm going to choose zero off same side, and you'll see that this little dot on these little images here shows you what we'll be referencing when we go ahead and zero our machine. You can choose to do this whichever way you feel most comfortable, but for me I kind of like this setup. I'm going to set my XY datum to the bottom left hand corner. My flip direction is going to be left to right. I'm going to use a very high modeling resolution and I'm going to leave my material settings as they are and then just go ahead and click OK. And to do this, I'm going to need to import in a 3D model. So let's go to my modeling tab and we're going to choose to import a component or 3D model. We'll navigate over to our tutorials file in the two sided Merlin folder and we'll find the Merlin underscore fb.obj and we'll open that up. And because this file format doesn't have some important information like orientation, then we're going to have to go ahead and set this by using our import 3D model and transform dialog. So if you look straight down on our job, you'll see that our material block is hidden, but it's right here. It's actually the red box here. So our model is obviously way too big for our material. So to, to get it to fit, what we're going to need to do is to play around a little bit with the initial orientation of our model. So we can go ahead and we can look at this from all different ways, the back, the left, the bottom, the front, and the right. And that's probably the right orientation that we want to bring this into, into our software with. Now we can rotate about our z-axis by using some presets here that we have. So I can go 180, 90, 0, that's back where it started from, plus 90 or plus 180. And for me, I'm going to go with minus 90. Now also you'll see in the middle of our 3D view is our transform or our rotational gizmo here. So you can go ahead and rotate this slightly on its edge. It's a little easier to see sometimes. And then left click and hold on any of these circles and you can rotate this in the direction that that circle is going in. And that makes it easy to make little tiny tweaks to the position of your model. For now, I want to go back just to the minus 90 again, so I'll re-click on that, and I'll look straight down again on my model. Now, as you can see, my model is still way too big for my material block, so let's go ahead and change the largest dimension in our model size here to 8, and you'll see that I have the lock X, Y, and Z ratio turned on, so when I hit apply, all of my different X and Y and Z dimensions will be affected in proportion to the change number. So in this case, I put eight there. So everything else is changed appropriately and I can click apply. And you'll see now it sort of fits inside of my material block. I can turn it up on its edge and make sure that it does. That looks really good, I'm happy with that. All I really wanna do now is just center my model inside of that material block and there we go. That looks really good, I'm quite happy with that. Let's look back down on that again. Now we're going to go ahead and click on Position and Import. And this is where we can decide where our model sits relative to the modeling plane. Currently in our 3D view, you can see our model. And then you also see a hazy rectangle around the model. And that's a representation of your modeling plane. The parts of the model that fall below that will also be hazy. So you can get a good idea of what you'll be able to reach from this side of your job. Equally, if we turn it over, we can see what we can reach from this side of the job. Let's just go ahead and look back on that straight from the front side. Later on in this tutorial, we'll show you how to get to some of those gray areas below your modeling plane by way of moving a limiting plane that we'll talk about in a little bit. Now we have control over where our model is positioned relative to our modeling plane. So if we look down the x-axis, we can use this slider to raise and lower our model 
through the modeling plane until we get it to the desired location where we can get the most amount of detail that we can from each side. For now, we'll leave it right in the middle. Now in our job, we are gonna get it to create both sides. So we're gonna go ahead and click that. And now we have the option of putting in an overcut distance. The overcut distance will allow us to pass by the modeling plane so that we can eliminate the cusping that will happen with our round ball nose tool. We're gonna to be using a 1 8 inch ball nose end mill for our finishing pass. And as it travels down the side of the model and comes in contact with our modeling plane, you're gonna end up having a cusp and that will be equal to the radius of our tool. So in this case, we're just gonna type in the radius of our tool and we're gonna use that as our, as our overcut distance. Now this is only a starting point because we'll have the opportunity to control this better once we import in our model. But for now, it's always good to include this as being your radius of your finishing tool. Now we also have the option of highlighting our undercuts. So if we look back down our model again, we can go ahead and turn that on. And any of the pink areas are areas that the software feels we won't be able to reach with our tool from this angle or from the top down. The results of this will vary based on the quality of the model that you have. In this case, there are some areas that obviously we can get to, but because of the way the model was exported originally, the facets are quite large. Hence, there's areas like this, where one corner of that facet might be tucked underneath the fin, so the software is telling us that we can't reach that but in reality, we'll be able to reach most of that from here. Now the highlighted undercuts also take into account your overcut distance. So if we change this to be one and we click update, then you'll see that we'll be able to access more of those areas than what we could before. We're just gonna put that back to 1.25 and we'll up that, update that again. Now, if you feel that you can get to some of those areas by rotating your model slightly, then you can go back to the previous form, rotate it, and then come back in this again and take a look. If you require more control when bringing in 3D content, then I suggest you have a look at the segmenting video, where if you have a spire, you can go ahead and segment your, segment your model into more than just two parts, hence having more control over undercuts. Now, if you need even more information about importing in 3D content, I highly suggest that you take a look at the importing and exporting 3D data video. For now, what we're gonna do is uncheck the highlight undercuts and we're gonna import the model as it is. Okay, let's take a moment now and discuss what we're seeing here in our 3D view. As you can see up here, this is our top view of our job. And this is the top part of our Merlin. Now, if we flip it over, you'll see that this is the bottom part of our Merlin and it is flipping based on the flip direction that we had set up originally in our file. So that is left to right. So the top is this way and we flip it left to right and we'll get the other side and so on. In the component tree, we have three levels that have automatically been created. Model, which contains the Merlin model, a level that we can add 3D tabs to, to help hold our Merlin in our material block once it's all cut out. And then we have a level called limit planes that contains a component called the limit plane. And this plane is the overcut distance that we specified in the previous dialog before we imported in the model into the software. Now let's have a look at our X axis or look down along our X axis. The modeling plane is at zero and that's where our 3D toolpaths would have been limited to if we hadn't have used the overcut distance. And you can see just below that is the limit plane. And that limit plane is 1 8th of an inch down from our modeling plane. And this will help to eliminate the cusping that we could have happen as our tool travels across our model and cuts it out. This cusping would have created a small seam around the outside of our model that would have been hard to remove by hand with sanding. And with that limit plane, it will allow us to basically get all of the details that fall below the modeling plane that we normally couldn't get, like the tail and this fin here. If we go to the properties of the limit plane, so let's just click that and let's go up here to the wrench and click that. You'll see that it has a base height of minus 0.125. And that's that 1 8 overcut distance that we entered in the previous dialogue. And we have the, the ability to alter this right now if we would like to, to help us get to some of the things that are hidden right now 
that our cutter can't get to. The model that we can see here, whether it's above or below the modeling plane, will get cut. Anything we can't see won't. So we know that with the 1 8 over cut distance, we'll also be cutting the fin and part of the tail. But what about the area of the tail that we can't see? Well, this is where we can adjust the limit plane to cut further down past the model plane to get to the areas of the model that realistically belong to this side. So we can use this slider to alter the base height of this component to the point where we can see all of the detail that we want to cut. And as I move the slider down, you'll see that some extra details will be revealed. And right back here, you can see there's a little tiny fin that we want to make sure that we cut. So let's just go ahead and keep moving that down until we're happy with all the areas that we want to cut. And I think that looks great there at minus 0.33. Now let's close that and then off click the limit plane. Now let's go ahead and switch to the other side and we can use the number one or the number two on our keyboard to flip from front to back. So if I press number two, I'll go to the back. If I press number one, I'll go to the front. So let's press number two again and go to the back. So the only thing that we're really missing from this side is the actual beak or the bill of our Marlin. So let's go ahead and alter that limit plane again by selecting it and going into our component properties. And again, let's just slide it down until we get to a point where we can see everything that we want to be able to cut. That's getting there. Look a little bit too far. Now, somewhere's right around there would be perfect, I think. And then we can just go ahead and click close. And let's just have a look at that. And yeah, I think we're gonna get everything that we need to with that position of our limit plane. Let's go straight back down on that again. Let's go back to our front. So now that I'm happy with what we're gonna be cutting on each side, we need to think about adding tabs to hold this part into place. To do this, we're gonna position tabs on the top side of our job and then simply copy those over to the bottom side. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we have our tabs level selected here and you see it's bold so that it is, it is selected. So when we bring in our tabs, they'll fall in onto that level. We're gonna to go to our clip art tab and in our clip art, we're gonna find a folder called 3D Tabs. Now, if you've gone ahead and downloaded and installed all of the free clip art that comes along with your software, then you'll find this file will be there for you. And we're just gonna look for a tab called underscore circular, and we're gonna double click on that. And let's go back to our modeling tab, and you'll see that that has been imported directly into our tabs level. And we can now just kind of move that over to where we want it to be. Let's position that here. And we're gonna turn it around. So press nine on our keyboard twice to rotate that. And we'll position one there. We're not gonna worry about how thick they are right now until we get all of them positioned. And then we're gonna go ahead and copy this across our job to the other side of our base. So that's gonna be Control, Shift, and H. So Control to make a copy, Shift to cross the plane, and H to be the horizontal plane. And there we have it. And then we can go ahead and just slide that into place where we want it to be. If we hold down the Alt key while we're dragging it, it will lock it to that plane. That looks perfect. And the last one, we're gonna drag up here, we're gonna hold down our Control key, and we are gonna position that right around here somewhere. And then we're gonna rotate that to fit right up here by the top of the Marlin's head. We'll just kind of make sure it touches it right there. Now let's have a look at the thickness of these tabs, starting with the two at the bottom here. So if we go ahead and select this tab and we go to our properties, we'll see that this tab is a quarter inch thick. Now seeing as we're gonna be copying these to the other side of our job, in the end, this tab will be a half inch thick and that's probably a bit aggressive for what we need. So let's go ahead now and size this down to be 0.15 of an inch. And that means that the combined total of this tab will be 0.3 of an inch, which should be plenty. Let's do the same for this one over here. And then for the one up by the Marlin's head, we're gonna make it much thinner because it ends up, we don't want to end up having it um, interfere with the design of the top of the Marlin's head. So let's thin that one right out. We're gonna make this be 0 0.05 of an inch. And in total, 0.1 of an inch should still be enough to hold the Marlin in place without too much of a problem. So let's close this down and look straight down our job again. Let's go ahead and select all of our tabs. 
So having the top one selected and holding down our shift key and clicking the bottom one, we'll, click, we'll select all of our tabs or anything in between those two components that we clicked on. We can right click here and we can say copy to the other side. If we look at our other side, you'll see that we have tabs on the other side now. We'll flip back to our front again. Now, just to be sure that everything is proper, let's go ahead and have a look at our job in a multi-sided view. So we can either click this icon right here, or we can press the equals key on our keyboard to flip it over to the multi-sided view. And there we have the multi-sided view of our part. And those are going to be thick enough to hold that into place. That one's perfect just to stabilize the top of his head. And this one over here is perfect as well. So let's just go ahead and look back down on that again. And let's turn off our multi-sided view. And then let's, let's now think about how we are going to align our job when we flip it left to right to make sure that our front and our back always line up. To keep my material aligned in X and Y when we flip the material over, I'm going to look at using a non-symmetrical dowel hole method. This is where we would drill dowel holes partially through the top side of our material. And then in the software, we would copy the dowel positions of the top over to the bottom. We will separately drill the holes from the bottom side directly into the spoil board, thus allowing us to have perfect alignment in X and Y when we flip the material block over. Now there are many other methods that you could use, but this method is fail safe as it allows us to mirror the non-symmetrical hole pattern and machine it directly into the spoil board. This will ensure that when we flip the material that we only have one way that we could possibly relocate it to the machine surface. So this eliminates the fact that you might flip the part the wrong direction to what we set in the software. If you want to learn more about the different methods of flipping your material over, take a look at the introduction to two-sided machining tutorial, which can be found in the related video section for this tutorial. Okay, let's go ahead and tile our views from left to right. And then in our 2D view, we're going to draw three circles. So let's go to our drawing tab and bring up our draw circle tool. And I went into the labs and I found out that we had some dowels that are a diameter of 0.33 of an inch. And now what I can do is I can just interactively drop these in anywhere in my 2D view. And I'm gonna use three of them. That way there's no way that I can mess up the flipping. And these are gonna be random locations. And again, that'll make it so that I can't mess up the, um, the flipping if I was to use four in the corners, then of course I could mess it up. So these being non-symmetrical in different places makes it pretty much fail safe. So I can't put this back down on my spoil board the wrong way. So let's go ahead and close this down. Now with that, I'm pretty much ready to move on to developing some tooling for this project. So let's go ahead now and move over to our tool pass tab. Okay, the first thing we always do before we start setting up our tooling is take a look at our material setup. So let's click that. And we'll see that our material thickness that we set up originally is one inch, which is still fine. The datum is set to the bottom left-hand corner, and that's perfect. For this side of our job, we're going to be zeroing off the top of our material. Remember, when we do the bottom side or the back side, we're going to be referencing our machine bed. But for this side, we're going to be referencing our material surface. We're going to see that our model position is currently in the middle of our material, which is perfect. Sometimes you'll find it at the top. If it's at the top, you want to make sure that it's in the center of your material. With this kind of a job, that's important because the top of your material or the bottom of your material isn't flat, then you could end up missing areas or having flat areas on the proudest bits of your component here. So we're going to make sure that's in the middle. And you can see that's correct because our gap above and our gap below are equal, and that's reflected in the little diagram here. Now below that is our model thickness. So this model thickness, the 0.9322, is the total thickness of our top and our bottom of our job. So it's less than the one inch, as you can see, and the balance of that is divided up evenly between the top and the bottom. And then our modeling plane is set at half an inch, so right in the middle of our material, which is perfect. This is good information to know, just to double check that everything is okay. Now our rapid Z gaps above our material, these are safe and appropriate for our machine, so we're going to leave them just as they are. Our home and start position is perfect, but I want you to note this quarter inch right here. That's important. Okay, so let's click OK. 
Now the first toolpath we're going to create is going to be our dowel holes in the top of our material. So we're going to go over here and holding down our shift key, we're going to select those three circles that we created. And we're going to create a profile toolpath. Our start depth is going to be at zero and our cut depth is going to be at 0.7 of an inch. Okay, we're going to use a quarter inch end mill, that's perfect. We're going to cut inside that circle. We're not going to use any ranch or ramp or plunge moves. We're not going to add any tabs. And we're just going to call this dowel holes. And then we can calculate that. And you'll see that these are starting at the top of our material and are going to cut down into it. And that's perfect. Let's preview that visible tool path. And that's exactly what we want to see. Perfect. Let's close this down. Now the next tool path we're going to create is going to be a 3D roughing tool path. So let's select that. We're going to use that quarter inch end mill for that. So we don't need any, to do any bit changes between our dowel holes on this. That's perfect. Now we need to decide our machining limit boundary. So we could use our model boundary if we would like to, but the software will then take the composite model and create a boundary from it and cut around that or cut inside of that. That's probably not going to help us any because if we do use that, then these tabs won't be holding our Marlin into our material block when we're all done. So we don't want to use that option. We don't want to include these tabs in our cut. We could use the material boundary, but that would wipe out all of this material and these tabs definitely wouldn't be holding onto anything. So we can't use that. We could use a selected vector, but right now we don't have a selected vector developed in our 2D view to contain our tooling to, but we could use a selected level. If we remember back in our importing, we have these three levels that were set up and the bottom one is the model level with our Marlin model on it. And seeing as we just want to be cutting the Marlin out of this, we could just simply select this level. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll make sure that we choose model. We're going to cut outside of this boundary of our Marlin by a quarter inch. That's the diameter of our tool, which is pretty standard for a roughing tool path. We're going to leave behind a 0 0.02 inch skin of material for our machining allowance so that we can come back with our bullnose end mill during our finishing pass and get all that nice detail back again. We're going to use some Z level roughing as our roughing strategy. We're not going to have any angle. We're not going to use any ramp or plunge moves and we're just going to rename this 3D roughing and we can go ahead and calculate that. Now that looks pretty nice in our 3D view. So let's just go ahead and preview that visible tool path and make sure that we're happy with what we see. And that's exactly what I see. You can see the step down and the pockets that were created when we used that Z level roughing and that looks really nice. And our tabs are in there as well, still holding it into place. So that's perfect. Let's close this down. And now let's go ahead and do our finishing pass. Let's click that. We're going to remove that tool out of there and we're going to go ahead and select a new tool. The 1 8 inch ball nose we're going to choose and we are going to select that. We're going to use the same option in our machining limit boundary to be selected level. So let's choose that. And we're going to make sure that we put the boundary offset equal to the diameter of this tool. So it's going to be 1 8. So 1 divided by 8, press the equals key on our keyboard, and that's going to be our boundary offset. We're going to use a machining strategy of a offset tooling, which is perfect. And we'll just go ahead and change this to 3D finish. And we'll calculate that. Let's go ahead and preview the visible tool path. And that's exactly what we were expecting to see. And that looks really nice. You'll see that our tabs again are still holding in our Marlin to that material block. So that's perfect. And let's look straight down on that. Now I want to point out the actual depth of this cut right here. You'll see that it's actually at point or minus down here at the bottom. You'll, you can read it right there. It says minus 0 0.8299. And that is obviously past the center of our material block. So that limit plane that we put in place is working perfectly. We're cutting by the center of our material. Now it's also important to look at that number and figure out whether or not your tool is actually long enough to fit down in there without causing any problems. So that's a good little check to make sure that that's going to be all right. So let's look down on that again and let's close this down. Now let's go ahead and flip over to our 
backside and start to develop the tooling for that. Now, seeing as we're looking at a different side of our material, let's take a look at our material setup again, and let's click that. And again, we have um, a thickness is one inch. Our data is set to the bottom left-hand corner. But now we're zeroing off our machine bed, and you'll see that indicates that right here. And if we turn this up on its edge, you'll see now that we're zeroing off the bottom of our material block here, opposed to the top, okay? This is all the same. We do not want to change any of this, leave it exactly the same as what it is. If we shift the position of our model, then we could end up with results that we don't want. Our Z gap, Z gaps are perfectly fine, and our home start position, again, is a quarter inch above our material. And that's important because we're now zeroing off our machine bed, so this quarter inch is going to be really important in a second. So let's click OK. Now up here, you'll see that our home position has now been changed. So it's zero, zero, which is that corner, but is now one inch, which is our material thickness, plus the quarter inch safe height that we set back here in our Z gap above our material. So let's click OK there. So that just reiterates where we're going to be setting our zero off of again, OK? So that's important to remember. So the first toolpath we're going to create is going to be our dowel holes toolpath, but you'll see that those vectors aren't here in our 2D view. So I've obviously forgotten to copy them from front to back. So let's go back to our front again. Let's select those three dowel holes, right click on those, and we're going to copy to the other side. And then we flip them over. You'll see that they'll flip sides because we're flipping our model left to right. And now when we reselect them on this side, we can go ahead and create our dowel hole tool pass. Now remember, we won't be cutting these directly into our material block. These will be cut directly into our spoil board. So that's why they're flipped left to right. So they're a mirror of what we see on the top of our material. Knowing that, what we're gonna need to is to have a start depth that's equal to our material thickness. So that's gonna be one inch. And then we're gonna go down from that, the 0.7 into our spoil board. We're gonna use the same end mill. We're going to cut on the inside. We're not going to have any ramp or plunge moves. And we can just go ahead and call this dowel holes. And we're going to make a big note to ourselves in spoil board. Okay, and we're going to calculate that. So we're going to get this error. And it's okay because we know that we are not going to have our material on our machine. When we cut the top tool paths, we're going to take our material off our machine. And then we're going to cut these holes directly in to our spoil board. So it's really not going to matter. We know what's going to happen. So let's just go ahead and click OK. And then when we look at this, you'll see that these holes are at the bottom of our material block, which is what we want. We want them to be cut into the spoil board because this material block will not be on our machine, okay? Straight down on that again, and we can preview the visible tool paths. It's not gonna make much sense, but we just can reassess whether or not they're in the right spot or not, and that looks great. So I'm happy with that. Let's close this down. Okay, so just one more time, what we're gonna be doing is we are going to take our material block off of our machine when we cut the top side. We're gonna cut our dowel holes into our spoil board. We're gonna push in our dowels, and then when we turn over our material block and push it back down on top of those dowels, the asymmetrical position of those dowels will ensure that we are lining up our part properly. And then we're still gonna to have to go ahead and use some sort of hold down for our material block. Now again, let's go ahead and do a 3D roughing toolpath. We can use the same tool, the same option here, selected level for our machining limit boundary. We're going to make sure we choose that model level. And all this is perfectly this perfectly fine, just as it is. Delete that out of there. We'll calculate that. We can preview that visible tool path. Now, at this point, if I wanted to, I could preview all sides of my tooling to see if I'm actually cutting through properly or not. So let's go ahead and do that. And you'll see that I'm actually going to cut right through, but those tabs are still going to hold it there. And that looks really great. Really happy with that. Okay, so let's just go ahead and close that one down. And let's do our 3D finishing pass for this side. We're going to use that same ball nose. Make sure we use the selected level as our machining limit boundary. Just re-select that level that we want to use. The boundary offset is correct. We'll use the same offset tooling that we used before. We'll just call this 3D finishing. And we can calculate that. 
Then we'll preview all sides again so we can make sure that we see the finished part once it's finished cutting. And there we have it. Now look at that, that worked out really, really well. We're getting all the detail and thanks to that limiting plane, you can see that we got all the stuff below the center of a material block that we wanted to. The tabs are being held in place and that looks really great. So now one thing we might want to do is just check to see how thick these tabs are in the end to make sure everything's worked out okay. If we hover over those tabs and note down here in the bottom right hand corner, if I hold down my control key, it'll tell me the thickness of that tab. So we know that 0.3 was what we expected there, which is perfect. And up here should be around 0.1, which is exactly what we expected. And also this gives you a good opportunity to check any other thin spots that you might see in your model and maybe make some appropriate decisions on how to deal with those. For instance, the thickness of our fin here might be too thin for the chosen material. And that looks great. So let's close that down. Let's look back to the front of our material again. Now, if you want to go ahead and save off the tooling, then please have a look at the toolpath savings guide to learn how to do that. And now we can go ahead and save this off. Let's go file, save as, we'll save it in our two-sided Merlin folder. .crv file, we'll press enter and that's saved off now. So you can have a look at that if you'd like to. And with that, you know pretty much everything there is to know about importing in a 3D model and creating tooling for a double-sided part.